Charles, I think you can uh, you can start with uh, Ayrton Poy. <laughs> okay, I'll do that. All right. So I've told you enough about infinity categories to get going with, I hope. So let me recall a definition of Groton de Topos. This is my favorite definition because it's so compact. So a Groton de Topos, it's a category E, so that there exists a bunch of stuff. So you have a small category C. These are one categories. I'm in one categories now. Um, a fully faithful functor from E to the category of pre sheaves of sets on C, which has a left adjoint. And furthermore, that left adjoint it preserves finite limits. So it's left exact. So they're the left exact localizations of pre sheaf categories, is how people often say this. Um, so you can show, it's well known that there's a correspondence between these left exact localizations of the pre sheaf category and the grown deke topologies on C. So this actually recovers the, the very familiar, at least familiar to many people, characterization of a grown deke topoi as sheaves on a grown deke site. Um, let me rant a little bit about this. This is well known. This whole theory, it's in the SGA, for instance back to the beginning of the subject. Um, it's not as well known as it should be, at least when I was young and learning about all these things, learning what a topos is, learning what Grotendieck topology is. I did not know this fact for a long time. I knew about a Grotendieck topology, and that seemed interesting, but kind of complicated and a little ad hoc. And I didn't understand that, well, it actually has this very simple characterization. Of course, you need to know what Grotendieck topologies are in order to work with this, but it's a very cute characterization. Um, you know, some books on, you know, Topoi don't mention this at all. Many do mention it, but it's not in chapter one. So I never ran into it for a long time. All right. So that's what a, a Grotendieck Topos is. Um, it's convenient to not have to mention Grotendieck topologies at this point. We'll see why later. But the one reason is that we can take this definition and automatically port it into infinity categories. Oh, before I do that, let's notice that some of the properties of Topoi actually just follow directly from that definition. For instance, um, pre sheaves of sets are Cartesian closed by a standard ar argument. You know how to write down the internal function object. And if you take one of those things, and if you have one of these left exact localizations, let's say E is actually a subcategory, and you have this left adjoint, which is called sheafification, then if you have an object Y in the subcategory, then it's easy to check that the internal function object is also in the subcategory. And in fact, it's an internal function object there. This actually only uses the fact that L preserves products. That's the property you need. Um, one fact about topoi is that the slice of a topos over an object is also a topos. So if I have pre sheaves on C and then I have one of these full subcategories E and I pick a, an object in the full subcategory, I get um, functors on the slices. The inclusion restricts to a, a fully faithful functor on slices and the left adjoint restricts because X is LX to, or isomorphic, it restricts to a functor on the slices, which is a left adjoint, and in fact is left exact. Um, and this category of pre sheaves sliced over X is actually equivalent to a pre sheaf category of sheaves on some comma category. So from this definition, it's kind of easy to show that a slice is a topos. And then you can also produce sub object classifiers. That's, you know, if you have, you, easy to, you can construct the slab object classifier and pre sheaves and then the left adjoint gives you an item potent on that sub object classifier and you split off that item potent that turns out to be a sheaf and that's the guy that's a theory that's probably familiar to some people okay so this is a nice characterization and it's the one that I'll generalize so an infinity topos so I've put in red the things that change 
from the previous definition, it's an infinity category E. Since there exists a small infinity category C, an accessible and fully faithful functor from E to the infinity category of pre sheaves on C valued in infinity groupoids. I will use this notation a lot. This will always mean pre sheaves of infinity groupoids. I can't spell pre sheaves. And it has to have a left adjoint, and that left adjoint has to preserve finite limits. That's the definition. Okay. I do need to explain accessible. So that's a technical condition that not did not appear in the original definition I gave for a Grundig topos. And I, I don't want to dwell on this. It's technical. And it's the it comes from the infinity categorical analog of the theory of accessible categories, accessible one categories. So I've written out the definition here. If I have some co-complete C, I can talk about a functor preserving kappa filtered co-limits. That's what an accessible functor is, where kappa is a regular cardinal. And the functor is kappa filtered. So a kappa filtered co-limit is a co-limit on a kappa filtered category. And there's a definition of kappa filtered category in terms of extending cones of kappa small infinity categories. So if you take out the infinities here, you get a very familiar notion. In fact, for omega, a countable cardinal, and one categories, that's the notion of a filtered uh, one category. And there's these cardinal general generalizations. And all that carries out in infinity categories. This is done by Jacob Lurie in his big book. Um, in a Grotendieck topos, the one categorical notion accessibility of of the inclusion follows from the other actions so it's accessible too i just didn't need to include it as an axiom here i'm going to want to presumably i could leave it out but i don't think that's been very well studied so we'll stick with this all right um, while I'm at it, let me introduce this other concept called a presentable infinity category. And this is the infinity categorical generalization of what's called locally presentable infinity categories, the locally presentable categories, excuse me. If you don't know what that is, it's good to learn about it. I wish I had known this much earlier than I learned it. A presentable infinity category, it's the same list of definitions, um, except that I'll drop the fourth one that the left adjoint be left exact. It doesn't have to preserve finite limits. Um, almost anything of consequence ends up being a presentable infinity category, or in one category is a local presentable ca category. You know, categories of algebras like groups, rings, those are all locally presentable. So this is a very large class of things, which are always complete and co-complete and have various good properties. I don't want to dwell on this, but it's an interesting uh, useful concept. Um, so one question you may ask is, OK, I didn't use Grotendieck topology in my definition, so where are they going to be? And I will come back to this uh, question later. Um, the following is true, though. If I have a Grotendieck site on a one category, so a Grotendieck topology on a one category, a usual notion of a Grotendieck site, then I can form an infinity topos, which will be a full subcategory of the pre sheaves of infinity categories on this one category C, consisting of sheaves. Um, for instance, in the in this special case when I have a topological space, then C is the post set of open sets on X. The Grotendieck topology is the usual topology. And the sheaves are the ones I defined in the previous hour. It's literally that definition I gave. Um, and I could give a similar definition in the case of a general Grotendieck uh, site. Okay. So these are examples of infinity topoi. Um, are they all of them? We'll find out. All right. I do want to make sure I 
don't go over on time. There's a lot of material here, some of which I can pass over quickly. All right. So what I want to do in this um, hour is talk about a characterization of Grote Dick Topoi that's more intrinsic. So you'll, you can, what I'm going to talk about is analogous, although not identical, to what's called the Giraud theorem. Um, which is a characterization of Groton Dick Topoi. And I've written it here. I'm not really going to talk about most of the elements, some of the elements of this definition, but I just wanted to put it up here so you know what I'm talking about. Um, a one category is a Groton Dick Topos if it's locally presentable. So some one of these nice categories. And then it has uh, three more properties, which are have a more elementary character. Co-limits are universal, co-products are disjoint, and equivalence relations are effective. Um, we're not going to meet these last two. I just don't want, I, I don't, this particular formulation is not the one that's going to generalize to infinity topoi. So I don't want to take a lot of time talking about it. But there are characterizations like this for Grote Dick topoi. It's a locally presentable category with some additional properties. So here's what one of the possible characterizations of infinity topoi you can write down, analogous to the one I just gave for one topoi, or Grote Dick topoi. Um, an infinity category E is an infinity topos if and only if it is presentable, in the sense I described earlier. And then two more properties, which are the ones I want to focus on. Co-limits are universal. That appeared in my statement of Giraud's theorem. And Co-limits satisfy descent. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about this equivalence and these properties. I should say here before I go on, people often group these two things as one property and just call it descent. If you have property three, you usually want to have property two too, so they go together. I'm following the Leary here and keeping them as separate concepts. What I want to do first, before I go into the definitions of these, um, I want to talk about homotopy theory. These things actually have roots in homotopy theory. And I think it's good to sort of establish, you know, see how that works out, because these kinds of conditions don't come from nowhere. They actually come from something that, you know, it already existed and was there to be sort of generalized. Another reason is that this particular property of descent that I'm going to talk about isn't satisfied in any one category at all, except the trivial one category. So there isn't a good one categorical model for it. And for that reason, it's good to give you some intuition as to how to think about it. All right, so I want to think a little bit about homotopy theory. So I've told you that the homotopy theory of spaces is the same as the, somehow the same as the infinity category of infinity groupoids, whatever that means. But people did homotopy theory long before they knew what an infinity category was. Um, in that context, we talked about something called homotopy limits and co-limits. So going back very early into the subject, people recognize there are certain kinds of diagrams often limit or co-limit diagrams in spaces that had a special role. For instance, when you write a, a, a space as a union of two open sets, and then you have the intersection, that's important. This behaves well for many reasons. For instance, it behaves well with respect to invariance like homology, in general, homology theories. Um, that's the Meyer-Vitoris theorem, which tells you how to compute roughly how to compute the homology of X from the homology of the pieces U, V, and U intersect V. Another example are fiber bundles. So if you have a fiber bundle of, of whose fiber is homeomorphic to F, then this behaves well with respect to homotopy groups. You have the long exact sequence and homotopy. So these have a very important role, and they're special cases of what are called homotopy pushouts and homotopy pullbacks. So in uh, homotopy theory, say in spaces, 
you can identify certain classes of commutative squares as being homotopy pushouts or homotopy pullbacks. Um, one way you can do it is you can say that a commutative square is a homotopy pushout. If you connect, can connect it by, nat, by um, natural transformations, which are weak equivalences at every corner, to a square of a particular form. For instance, a square which is an honest pushout along a nice map called a cofibration. And analogously, there's a complementary theory where you take a pullback along a fibration, and those that gives you the basic examples of homotopy pullbacks. Um, so there's a recipe for computing homotopy pushouts or homotopy pull pullbacks. So if you have a homotopy pushout, very often you have some random map on one side of your square. And what you do is you factor it through a cofibration and a weak homotopy equivalence. And you would take the actual pushout where you replace, that's called B prime, you replace the original, let's call, let's call it B tilde, B prime on the page. You replace the original map by that cofibration. You take the push out and that's a homotopy push. So if you have a general square that doesn't involve a cofibration, that's how you compute it. So there are recipes like this that details aren't too important here. You can do this in spaces. You can do this in some plushal sets, which is also a model for the homotopy, for homotopy theory of spaces. Or you can do it in any Quillen model category. When I say, by the way, a homotopy theory has a model, I mean in the sense of Quillen model categories, which gives you these vibrations and co-vibrations and such. Um, in spaces, this actually leads to very geometric pictures. For instance, if I have a, a, a span like this, A maps to X and Y by some maps, which might be complicated and not inclusions in particular, I can replace it by something called the double mapping cylinder. I connect the images of those maps by a tube, A times the unit interval, and then I'm really forming a pushout along of A, included into some replacements for X and Y, which are X and Y together with some tubes with A on the end. That's an explicit construction of a homotopy pushout. So it's a good geometric pic picture to have. So the classical understanding of homotopy co-limits and limits was that they were derived functors. So they're in some sense, a precise sense, the best homotopy invariant approximation to the actual limit or co-limit in topological spaces or simplicial sets, or in general, in some Quillen model category, depending on what kind of homotopy theory you want to study. That was the classical understanding that was you know, made formal in the 70s. But now, in, in the infinity categorical language, these just correspond to what I called limits and colimits. So the infinity categorical limits and colimits, which are meant to capture a universe, you know, characterized by some universal infinity universal property, correspond to this older notion. All right. Now, in homotopy theory, the homotopy theory of spaces play a special role. There are many other homotopies. There's chain complexes and chain homotopy equivalences. There's simplicial rings and all sorts of weird things you can construct. But spaces are, of course, special. And they're not just special because they're the first example. And they're special. Well, they're special for various reasons. Um, one thing I want to you know, emphasize is that in spaces, the homotopy limits and columns have some additional properties, which are not shared by general homotopy theoretic settings. There's, so one question that you might ask is, what are, the, what are the properties of these constructions like homotopy limits and columns that are characteristic to classical homotopy theory, or what we would now say the infinity category of infinity group words? And the notion of infinity topos actually arises from one answer to these questions. So you may have heard or know that you can think of a, a topos as some sort of generalization of a category of sets, sort of a universe of generalized sets in some sense. It has features like the category of sets, 
and there's a precise analogy. Um, an infinity topos is a, is a universe of things that are like spaces from the point of view of homotopic theory. So this analogy is what is going to lead us to this characterization of infinity topoi that I want to talk about. OK, so still talking about homotopy theory, um, one thing I can talk about is what, what I'll call the universality of homotopy colimits. And I'll just do this in the special case of pushouts because I can draw the diagrams. I'll think about this primarily in the simplicial set model. Um, the simplicial set model has a feature. This underlying category, simplicial sets, is a topos. Pre-sheaves of sets, delta op, or delta rather. Um, and I'm going to make reference to the fact that it is a topos. But I also care about the homotopy theoretic aspects. So we can think about homotopy pushouts and simplicial sets, and those they're always weakly equivalent to pushout squares along monomorphisms. Now I could do the following. I could pick some map from y to x, call it p, and I can pull back the whole diagram, the whole square, along that map p. So these are also, if you like, the pre-images, which that should be y zero, the pre-images of the x's along this p. And I get a new commutative square. Let's do it in this case. I've drawn this picture again. So there it is. When I pull back, so I form this by pullback, but the right-hand square then maps the left-hand square. Um, notice the monomorph co-fibrations, by the way, I should have said here, in simplicial sets, it's very convenient in this case, co-fibrations are exactly the monomorphisms. So co-fibrations pull back to co-fibrations. Furthermore, you have an interesting property. This pulled back square is also a pushout. That is the fact that push pull, pull pushouts are universal, as they say, in simplicial sets. In fact, they are universal in any topos. If you pull back a pushout along a map to the target, you get another pushout diagram. Therefore, this other square, this, this square I said was some kind of homotopy pushout. It's an actual pushout, but it's along co-fibrations. This one's also a homotopy pushout. Let me, oops. Let me put one more thing into the mix. Um, let's suppose that, oh, sorry, I can keep going. This is just a slide explaining what universality of colimits means in a one topos or in a one category. So colimits of universal just means but if I have any morphism, if I consider the base change functor, which I'll call f upper star from the slice over x to the slice over y, that preserves all colimits. That's the definition of colimits are universal in a category with, with pullbacks. Um, in a one topos, it's even better. You actually have a right adjoint. Actually, you have two adjoints. You have a left adjoint always, but there's an interesting right adjoint which goes in the other direction. Because it preserves co-limits, you expect it to have a right adjoint, and it does. OK, so that's just a property of toposes. But now I want to put in the homotopy theory. I'll take my original, that diagram I had before, but now I'll actually draw it as a cube. So the top and the bottom squares are pushouts, and in fact, are examples of homotopy pushouts because they're along monomorphisms. And I'll suppose that this map here is a confibration, which is the correct notion of fibration in simplicial sets. It doesn't matter what it is. The important thing is that if I form pullbacks, I get pull confibrations along all the sides. That's what these double arrows mean. And therefore, by my general theory of homotopy pullbacks, all four sides are homotopy pullbacks. So I have a commutative square where I took the bottom square, which is a homotopy pushout, and then took the homotopy pullback along P of everything. And I observe I get a homotopy pushout along the top. So we'll give this property a name. We could say that homotopy pushouts are 
universal in the homotopy theory of simplicial sets, which is the same as the homotopy theory of spaces. That's the, if you like, homotopy, uh, the universality of homotopy uh, pushouts. And you can do this generally for any kind of homotopy colimit. I won't try to draw or define arbitrary homotopy colimit diagrams. The same thing works. You actually only need two cases. You need homotopy pushouts and you need coproducts. Those two cases, you can derive everything. All right. Now there's a more subtle property called descent. It's come to be called descent. Um, it's kind of the what happens if you do things in the opposite order. So the idea was that in this picture, I started with a some kind of push out, a homotopy push out. I pulled it back along a map to over the 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 the, the co-limit itself, and then I got another push out. I'm going to do this in the other order. I'm going to start with a commutative diagram like on the left here, where the squares are both homotopy pullback squares. And I'm being a little bit careful here. I'm not assuming they're homotop they're, they're honest pullback squares. A homotopy pullback doesn't have to be a pullback. It's just to construct it. That's the most convenient way to compute it. It just has to be um, weakly equivalent to a homotopy pullback square. But if I have a commutative diagram like this, I could take the homotopy colimits um, horizontally. The homotopy colimit construction can be constructed as an honest functor, so you'll get a map between homotopy colimits. And then the descent condition says that if I form commutative squares, which I have for each i, which involve the inclusion of each of these xi's into x and the corresponding ones of the y's into y, this resulting square is a homotopy pullback for i for all the values of i. So I start with a diagram um, with these pullbacks. I push out, and then I pull back again. And the descent says I get back to where I started. Except there are homotopy pushouts and homotopy um, pullbacks. Let me draw a picture. So let's take a, a map in spaces. So I'm going to draw the picture on top, but suppose we'll set it's the same. We, I would draw exactly the same pictures because honestly, as you can tell, I think of them as almost the same thing. Um, well, Let's take um, a diagram like this. On the bottom, I'll just have the one-point space and the two-point space. And then on the top, I'll just have copies of x, x over the point, x over the point, and then two copies of x, one over each point. Um, and I'll have this commutative diagram. I'll use the identity map in most places along the top, but here I'll use f in one of the places. So if I form a homotopy pushout horizontally, on the bottom, I, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to form these double mapping cylinder constructions. On the bottom, I'll just get a circle. On the top, I'll get a construction, which is also called the mapping cylinder of F. Um, so geometrically, you take X times an interval, here it is, and then you glue the ends together using the map F to identify the two ends or points in one end with the other end. Um, if F is a homeomorphism, this ends up being a fiber bundle with fibers homeomorphic to X. And furthermore, you get maps from each of these things back into the whole thing, and though you get some pullback squares. By the way, I should say here, when F is a homeomorphism, these are actual pullback squares. And so we're in a situation where we have actual pullback squares, and we get a fiber bundle. And then we check, oh, if we pull back, we get back to the original things. The fibers of this P are actually X. Um, my picture, by the way, looks kind of like a Klein bottle because I can't draw very well. But also, the Klein bottle is an example. Um, you use the sort of the obvious inversion of the circle and that produces the Klein bottle. Um, but I could instead do the following. Maybe F isn't a, a homeomorphism. It's just a homotopy equivalence. Then it, you don't get a fiber bundle in general. 
But you can still say that the homotopy fibers, that is the homotopy pullbacks along any point are homotopy equivalent or weakly equivalent to X. So you get a vibration up to homotopy, which has the correct fibers, if it's a homotopy equivalence. Of course, if it's a homotopy equivalence, these aren't pullback squares anymore because you're using some weird map, which isn't a homeomorphism. So in particular, the right-hand one could fail to be a homotopy, uh, fail to be a pullback. But if it's a homotopy equivalence, they'll still be homotopy pullbacks. Okay. This is not true in sets in the one category of sets where I'll just take equivalence to mean isomorphism and I don't have homotopy blocks, I just have pullbacks. Let's draw the same picture. I have a set X where, and I have some you know, automorphism of my set. I'll take pushouts. The pushout of the bottom is just a single point, not a circle. The pushout of the top is, well, it's a quotient of X where I sort of identify any point with its image under it. F, it's the orbits of F. And then for like I equal to one or two in my original diagram, I'll get squares like this. And I can ask myself, is this a pullback square? And the answer is that this is a pullback only if F was actually the identity map. But most of the time, it's not a pullback. It just fails. Descent does not work in sets, descent even for pushouts. I should clarify, and in fact, only in a one category in general, this doesn't happen very often. Um, it does work sometimes. For, for instance, if the maps along the bottom are monomorphisms, then you actually, it's okay. If you take a co if you take this diagram with actual pullbacks and sets or Roman topos and the, the horizontal maps are monomorphisms, then it is true that if you push out and then pull back, you get to where you started. But in general, it is not true. Okay. Um, so this page is for the homotopy theorists. I'll just pass by it. Um, the, the summary is that I don't know who first under, understood that descent was a thing. I think it's Graham Siegel who wrote a paper where he said it was well known. But then Apparently that held up the paper for a long time, getting a proof of that fact. All right. I have here a sketch of a proof. Shall I give this or shall I pass over it? I want to say one thing about this. Um, so you actually have to prove descent. And really the key case is push outs. So you can do this in simplicial sets. You write down one of these diagrams where you have these pair of homotopy pullbacks. You can always set things up so that the horizontal maps are cofibrations down here. And then these vertical things are fibrations. You replace the squares by equivalent squares. That's a standard reduction. Then you just have to form the homotopy colimit, and that will also be the form the colimit rather, and that will also be the homotopy colimit. And now you're asking if the resulting squares are pullbacks. Now there's a special case which has to work. It's when the squares are homotopy pullbacks and actual pullbacks of simplicial sets. Pullbacks in the underlying category, they're actually pullbacks, which generally a homotopy pullback doesn't have to be. So all you got to do is you got to replace your diagram with one where the squares are pullbacks. And the, the, the tricky part is you have to do it for both squares at the same time. So you're reduced to one particular problem. So I've expanded out one of these squares. So the original commutative square involved y0, y1, x0, x1. I have some cofibrations, some confibrations. There's the honest pullback. And it's a homotopy pullback means that the honest pullback along this confibration is weakly equivalent to the other space, the one that the other special set that was originally there. Um, what you want to do is you want to find something that goes here so that the top square is also a pullback so that this map on the side is a weak equivalence and this map is a confibration. If you can do that, 
then the whole rectangle is a pullback and it's a model for the homotopy pullback you wanted. Well, there's something you could try. Um, if I have a map in simplicial sets, I have a pullback functor and that has two adjoints, as I pointed out, a topos. And I'm interested in this right adjoint. Um, if J is a monomorphism, then in fact, um, if you form the right adjoint and then pull back again, that's the identity. That's a formal property. So if I put in here pi j of y0, j is this map here, I'll get a pullback square. And so the miracle is that this actually works. That's actually the solution to the problem. That's so I've now constructed an actual pullback square, which is also a homotopy pullback square. The hard part is showing these properties. Um, and that's the solution. I mention this because there's a long literature of attempted, you know, proofs of descent in various contexts, and they're often quite technical. I'm even responsible for such a paper. But now that nowadays there's a clean proof. This proof is due to Voivodsky. Um, he introduced this argument not to prove descent per se, but to prove something which is called the fact that simplicial sets are a model for univalent type theory. I may mention something about that before the end of these lectures. Okay, so I just wanted to sketch out that there is a proof to this in the language of classical homotopy theory. Um, quite possibly, yep. All right. Okay, so that's the end of this uh, this excursion into homotopy theory. So I'm going to return to the infinity categorical setting and give you some proper definitions. So if I have an infinity category that's complete and fine, sorry, co-complete, co-limits and finite limits, it has. Then I'll say it has universal co-limits if, for all morphisms, the induced pullback functor preserves finite limits is left exact. Ooh, of course, preserves, wrong. Preserves co-limits, duh. It is a finite limit. Okay, that's universality of co-limits, very easy to define. Now I wanna give descent. So this is a little bit more tricky. Um, so, okay, some definitions. Suppose I have a natural transformation of functors to an infinity category from an infinity category. I'll say it's Cartesian if for every morphism in the domain category, every one morphism, every one cell, um, the resulting commutative square I get is a pullback in E. This definition makes sense for one categories. I'll call this a Cartesian natural transformation. Now let's consider the arrow category of my infinity category. So delta one is the walking one morphism. So I'll call this E with an arrow. And I'll define a subcategory of the arrow category, which I'll call cart of the arrow category. This is the subcategory. Um, it's not full, but it's, it's wide the right term, buff. It, it has all the objects. Um, but it only has the morphisms that are Cartesian transformations. In other words, the objects are arrows, but the morphisms are just the pullback squares. And that actually does turn out to be an infinity category. And now I can define descent. I'll say that E has descent if this cart of the arrow category has all co-limits. And when I say that, I mean all small co-limits, as one does. And if the evident functor, the inclusion functor, back to the arrow category preserves co-limits. That is descent for all co-limits. You can also talk about descent for particular shapes of co-limits. You just restrict the co-limits of a particular shape. Um, I put this reference here because although in 1974, Pupa was not, did not know what an infinity category was, he only had homotopy columns. He nonetheless actually wrote down a formulation of descent 
in the homotopy theory of spaces, which is almost exactly the one I've just told you. All right. So given this, I can now give you the, the, the big theorem. An infinity topos, sorry, a theorem is that infinity topoi have universal co-limits and descent. Uh, I'll sketch the proof. Um, it's in steps. First, you show it for infinity groupoids. And that was the purpose of the previous discussion. This is this uses the simplicial set model of infinity groupers. Well, infinity groupers are con complexes, so it sort of was our definition. Um, so those arguments I gave you before are the proof in simplicial sets. I don't know any other way to do it. Then from that, you get that it's true for presheaves with values in infinity groupoids because limits and co-limits in a presheaf category like this are computed pointwise. So you can use the fact that you have these properties in S to prove them for presheaves. And then finally, you recall that a general infinity topos is a left exact localization of a presheaf category. And so you use the properties of left exact localization, L and I preserve finite limits and all co small co-limits. And those are the things that appear in these definitions, pullbacks and co-units. And so, you know, if you want to prove descent, you write down your diagram in E, form the pullback, um, you compute the, the, the limits in E, and you compute the co-limits by going into pre-sheaves, computing it there, and then applying the left adjoint. And that's also compatible with forming the limits because everybody preserves the finite limits, the pullbacks. It's, it's just a, the obvious argument. Every infinity topos has these properties because infinity groupoids do. We actually get a characterization. Um, an infinity category is an infinity topos if and only if it's presentable, co-limits are universal, and co-limits have descent. I've already told you one direction, so I'll sketch why the other direction is true, because it's interesting, and it is an illustration of descent. So this is the key property in some sense. It's the one that doesn't happen in one categories. Um, so that's the one we want to sort of keep an eye on. All right, so I'm gonna briefly sketch this proof. The first step is, is formal and is really sort of an application of this theory of accessible infinity categories. The analog works the same way in one categories. So if you have your infinity topos, you, need, you want to first find an essentially small subcategory C, which is closed under finite limits and such that the restricted Yoneda func functor so you have a Yoneda functor for E, but then you restrict the functors, the pre to the, the subcategory. You want that to be fully faithful and have a left adjoint. So everything um, except, um, except the, the, uh, the, the left adjoint being left exact. Um, also, I, I guess I also want I to be accessible because that was also a condition. So that comes out of this theory of accessible infinity categories. So you just pick C to be big enough. Um, so you might say something like this, where this is some full subcategory of what in this theory are called kappa compact objects. Um, in the theory of uh, the one categorical theory, the usual term is kappa presentable, but we changed all the terms for some reason. So with some, if you like a size condition. This is sort of standard, standard idea. It works just the same way, except that you need to do several hundred pages of work just to make sense of it. But in the end, you get to where, where you wanted. So I have everything except the L being left exact. And so of course I need the following proposition. So if I have E is a co-complete, finite complete infinity category, which has these two properties of universal co-limits and descent, I have a small finite complete infinity category, 
And then I have a co-limit preserving functor L um, then L is left exact if and only if it's composite with the Yoneda functor is left exact. I don't know. I hope it's clear. I always write, I don't know. I always write yo, rho for the Yoneda functor for some reason. Okay. So that's what I need. Um, there's that. This works in one category. So it works for topoi. So this works with this is also true if E is a one topos. You can, you can characterize this meaning if I replace infinity groupoids with sets, and that's colimit preserving, then if C has finite limits, I can determine these functors by using um, from this property involving the data, restricting along the data. Um, if that was the whole story, I would just stop here and say it's like one case, but the proof is actually a little different because it actually gives you something a little bit stronger. And this thing on this page is does not work the same way as it does in the classical setting. So let's suppose I have a co-complete finite complete infinity category, universal columnist and descent, and C is small, but maybe it's not finite complete. So I'll take that away. Same conditions, L is colon preserving. I want to know when the L is left exact. It's left exact if and only if two things are true. Um, one is that L preserves the terminal object. And the second is that L preserves pullbacks of the form like this. They're pullbacks of span or cospans of representable functors. So that's a particular class of pullbacks and presheaves. If L preserves these and it preserves the terminal object, then it's left exact. Um, this does not work in the same way if E is a one topos. As we saw yesterday, there's a condition that you have to put called, I believe, filtering, which is not this one. It's a little bit more complex to state. But in infinity categories, you get a very slick looking condition. It's actually kind of a miraculous this works out this way. It's a difference between the infinity and one sex. It's really a difference between sets and infinity groupoids. That's, that's what's different here. I'm not using sets, I'm using infinity groupoids. It doesn't work in a one topos. Oh, here's the illustration of why it doesn't work in a one topos, in case you're wondering. Um, so let me take my category C to be a group. And my topos will be sets. My colimit preserving functor will be colimits. So I can form a pullback in the pre sheaf category, which are just sets with a G action, where I'll take the terminal object and I'll take um, the representable functor, which is just G acting on itself. By the way, the hypotheses of, of that we're in this is this statement are true. Colimit of the terminal object is the terminal object, and it preserves pull, uh, pullbacks of representables because, well, because the group a group ha, a group has pullbacks, so pullback of representables are representable, and therefore it has to preserve it. But here's a pullback diagram that's not of representables because the terminal object isn't, so the pullback is really the product. If I form the co-limits of the G action, then I get it. I just get the point in three locations. And this thing will be isomorphic to as a set to G. Although this was a pullback, um, when I take the co-limits with respect to G, this is not a pullback. That's the illustration that this doesn't work in sets. One way people sometimes talk about it is they say that um, pullbacks are not a sound doctrine. But that's in only in one category. In infinity categories, pullbacks are a sound doctrine. OK. All right, so I have a few more minutes. Let me sort of, ooh, OK. Let me sort of sketch a proof. I may go through this quickly. So this is my setting. 
co-complete, finite complete infinity category, universal co-limits. I won't need descent for this. Here's a sort of a special case, which is much easier to prove. C is small. I have a co-limit preserving L. I'd like to know when it preserves pairwise products. And here are the condition it preserves pairwise products if and only if it preserves pairwise products of representables. Um, so I mentioned this special case because this works the same way in one categories. Um, the proof is the same as for infinity categories. This uses the fact that co-limits distribute over products in a topos. When I say it works for one categories, by the way, I mean it works for in, a, in a one topos. It also works if E is a one topos. So you do have universality of co-limits in a one topos, in particular of uh, you, can, you have this property that if you take a product of two co-limits over two different indexing categories, that's equivalent to the co-limits of the product over the product of the indexing categories. Um, and you can use that to prove that this implies this. It doesn't need descent, so it works for classical topo, right? Now let's think about this general case of pullbacks. Um, there's a special case I get immediately in my setting. So this is the special case where I have a pullback. This is in the category of pre-sheaves. So it's a pullback of the diagram of pre-sheaves where B is itself representable. So saying that L preserves this pullback, well, this, is, this pullback is really a product in the slice category. And L carries the slice to the slice over L of B. Um, these are both infinity. These are both infinity. Well, they both have um, universal co-limits and descent. I'm not writing very clearly. Universal co-limits and descent. They inherit it from pre-sheaves and from E. Um, but of course, this is also a pre-sheaved category. It's equivalent to one. It's pre-sheaves over the slice because that's representable. And I just told you the recipe for knowing that something preserves products. It just has to preserve products of representables. And a product of representables, you know, you know, in here, well, it's really a diagram like this. It's one of these pullback squares where it's a over coast plane of representables. So that's the lemma. So the lemma gives us the special case where it's a pullback where I have comma representable. I guess this part of the argument also works in a topos, I think. The problem is the general case. So here I have a general pullback in pre-sheaves. I'll write the bottom object as a co-limit of representables. Then for each of those representables, bi, I can pull back the whole pullback over that representable. So I'll get a, a, for each object in my indexing category. Oh, sorry, I'm kind of screwing things up here. This is not a, these are not pullbacks in i, these are pullbacks in the functor category from some indexing category of pre-sheaves. Sorry, I forgot there's another indexing here. So for each I, I get a, a square like this, and that's just a pullback square in pre-sheaves. So I got this whole collection of pullbacks. I have this pullback of diagrams. I should have said what func categories these were in. You get this pullback in pre-sheaves for each I. Um, but when you pull back pullbacks, you get more pullbacks. So you get a bunch of cubes, all of whose sides are pullbacks. So for each morphism in the indexing category, you get pullbacks of, of uh, pre-sheaves. Okay. However, we also know that B by construction was the co-limit of the representables. And then we have um, this property that co-limits are universal in pre-sheaves. 
So if I take the coulombs of these other functors, in the p, p, the p sub i, x sub i, and x prime sub i, those also recover px and x prime. Now, in all these pullbacks, the bottom right object is a representable. And we know that L preserves these pullbacks over a representable because that was the special case. Special case. Well, actually, not the left hand square, but there's a rectangle where they're both pullbacks. And the rectangle and the right hand pull, pullback are over one of these representables. And so you can patch pullbacks. So the left hand pullback will also be preserved by L. All right, so what I'll do is I'll apply L to all these. So I've done this, shown this here for this picture. Apply L, I get some more pullbacks. Oh, but L preserves co-limits. So if I take the co-limit of the PIs, the XIs and so forth, I get L of P, L of X, L of B. Now, I have this diagram on the top. Um, if you think about the, 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 this as these natural transformations, these are actually Cartesian natural transformations. These things here. I'm sorry, I wrote these here. These represent Cartesian natural transformations of functors from I into precies, each edge here, then I have this property called descent. Descent says that this has colons. Actually, these are in E, not in precies. This has colimits, and the, 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 if you like, the inclusion functor preserves colimits. So these are co-limits in the Cartesian category, but they're in the Cartesian category. So that means that these are also pullbacks. I form the pullback. L of P is a pullback of these LPIs. Sorry, I form the co-limit. L of P is the co-limit of the LPIs. Then I pull back again. I get pullbacks. That's descent. So what I care about is this map. L applied to the original pullbacks, where I'd like to know that's an isomorphism. What I've shown is that the pullback along each of these L of BIs is an isomorphism. Um, the pullback of this, so I didn't write the squares here, but the pullback of the original square, you know, of this square is, is the square LPI to LXI to LBI. LXI prime, and then universality of co-limits in E tells you that F is an isomorphism because LB is a co-limit of the LBIs. So if you, if you pull back to all the uh, pieces of the co-limit and you got an isomorphism, then you had to have an isomorphism. All right, that was, I hope, clear enough. Um, this was the key step. I used descent here at this step. Otherwise, I could have done this in a one tokenos, but this is the key step. So that's the proof of that property. Um, so that's the story of a uh, characterization of infinity topoi. Um, what I want to do next time, which I guess is tomorrow, is to develop some consequences of that. Um, the most interesting one which is the main one for the first hour next time, is to talk about the object classifier. So you may remember that uh, Topos has a sub-object classifier. Infinity Topos has an object classifier in some sense. You have something that's a little bit better than a sub-object classifier, and I'll say what that is next time. And I'll also talk about some other aspects, which are truncation and connectivity. That's the first hour, and then the second hour, I'll do some more things. We can leave that till tomorrow. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for uh, your uh, very uh, nice uh, lecture.